so uh, this we've already covered now what we'll do now is the next point okay so we've already covered this point as to why uh, arbitrage uh, o o option valuation obms are uh, not true afv okay we already covered this point now what we are going to do is we're going to continue that I want to just wrap up this discussion on models okay which is the other point that we are going to do is basically uh, we are going to do a generic um, uh, FPVV uh, actually not even FPV applies to everything okay generic uh, valuation model let's do a gen uh, we'll call it an asset valuation but you can value it for live use it for liabilities also obviously your my if I have lent you money my asset is your liability right so when we say asset in general unless there's a reason from the context to believe that we're only referring to assets you can also think of it as liability valuation because when you do low when you do other this project that you do you look at loan liabilities okay so there you have to be concerned with those values also okay loan liabilities also uh, you have to be concerned about generic asset valuation model okay so what we are going to do here is unfortunately I haven't got my drawing tools up it's a little difficult to do okay but let's do it this way so let's go back to this the other thing I think what might have happened is when you studied these uh, you studied all these things right project NPV stocks bonds and all that but I think when you studied them you were not clear uh, you were not uh, cognizant of the essential oneness of all these models were you able were you were you cognizant of that cognizant means being aware of okay but actually they are all the same okay what we are trying to show is that these are all the same and we are going to just introduce one uh, uh, you know let's look at first the basic steps you are already aware of when you have to value a project okay uh, when you have to look at the let's look at the uh, the, the the stock value uh, stack stock valuation model as a um, thing as a um, because in the NPV that you do uh, you are not, uh, taking the fair value and you're also taking the cost of the project right okay so uh, if you look at hopefully I think I have uh, the NPV picture here yeah so here what we do is now what, what I want you to understand is this that and is this let's try and make this a little bigger we can make it even 120 I think because we are at 90 percent okay so what I want you to understand you have uh, you understand now what is a forecast based fair valuation mm -hmm. yes. like when you do stocks okay what are you doing let's write down the steps here okay <coughs> Let's write down the steps here. Later on, I'll put this into a consolidated note on models, which you already have in your thing. I'll just expand that note. Okay, what are we doing? We have to value any asset. Okay, so what the point we are trying to understand is we are kind of trying to understand that all these things are actually the same. Okay, if you have it, if you understand it that way, it becomes much easier to recall. Okay, so these are all actually the same essential formula. That's why I've said here any asset. Okay, what do we do when we have to value any asset? And remember, this can also be a liability. Okay, generic asset valuation model okay so the first step is forecast returns from assets returns from asset okay is that what that's one step we have to forecast the returns this is forecast based this is all happening in your notes okay these are being written so you don't need to write these steps because this is being written in your notes so anytime I'm asked to value a bond or a stock or a project okay uh, or any asset okay if I let's say there was a transaction I think about a year back when uh, I think HCL tech bought a whole bunch of licenses from IBM okay they bought a bunch of licenses from IBM so basically intellectual property all right how would they value that so if you are giving a if you are given a problem like this then you should not fall from the sky saying oh I have only done bonds and stocks and projects I don't know how to value this you can you can value any asset using the same generic principles is this clear so you should not fall from the sky if you see a problem like this how should HCL value the what value what money would what price did HCL pay what should what should they pay for these IBM licenses okay how would you and so that is connected to the fair value obviously if they feel the fair value of those licenses is hundred million dollars then should they should ideally pay a little bit less than that right yes you agree yeah. if the fair value according to you is 100 million you should not be paying 120 million for that right you should be paying a little less so that you can capture that uh, surplus right so how would you value so therefore you have to first come up with a fair value for those licenses <coughs> so the point here is that any asset valuation there's a very generic formula forecast returns from asset okay first forecast returns from asset well, well let's make it very clear and we call it period wise okay 
or we can just call it periodic smaller word periodic returns this is meant to just show you that we are talking about year one year two year three year and year five that's what it means okay periodic periodic means uh, I mean basically it should be period wise but I'm just using a shorter word so this is meant to show that in every period that you're forecasting okay it's quarterly or and usually we take it to one year period okay so you're forecasting the returns which is over here right so many people in the in the exam also have written cash flows cash flows uh, that may not always be true okay uh, in the case of uh, uh, in this particular case project cash flows may be true but it's always better to use a general word like returns so if you say returns it covers everything it covers earnings it covers dividends it covers uh, you know uh, IBM licenses uh, revenue from IBM licenses that HCL tech will earn everything is covered under returns from the asset okay so that's a general expression all right so you forecast these okay and what is the next step someone can tell me discount. yeah so discount uh, yeah so this is over here actually okay so then uh, basically um, basically uh, PV the okay using appropriate or I'm not going to use such a big word proper I'm just going to say proper for appropriate actually it should be appropriate using proper discount rate this is clear now this discount rate could be cost of debt it could be cost of equity it could be your whack depends on what you are discounting okay so again I'm using a general term I'm not using uh, you know uh, cost of equity because that would be too specific it may not apply in all situations if I use a general term like discount rate it applies in all situations yes Rajan you're following okay so using proper discount rate this is your second thing that you're doing using proper discount rate all right so second step that gets you here so you've now done this you've got the periodic returns and you have discounted it yes okay and then obviously the last one very obvious um, add PVs okay add PVs to um, to get not to get total fair value using FBB methods okay is this clear all right so actually this is uh, in this case this is we are talking about um, for FBB you understand is for forecast based valuation okay yes but we are going to actually be able to apply it even in an option valuation situation even in uh, AFP situation so we'll make this a very generic model at the moment we are just for your familiarity we are discussing it with respect to um, so I'm not going to use this FPV method here okay this will go here actually okay let's put it actually I want to make this because this is a very generic model I'm just gonna keep it here uh, so that we don't write are you following so far we are just trying to understand the general principles okay make sure we understand that the everything that you've done is uh, application of general principles <coughs> using proper discount add PVs to get total fair value is this clear yes. yes so therefore in the NPV calculation that you do for a project normally this part leaving out the C0 the other terms the sum of the other terms is the fair value of the project yes you understand everybody normally thinks straight away you go to NPV you don't see the components of it right so the uh, part other than the cost of the project is the returns from the project is the fair value of the project yes okay so therefore what you have got is then your NPV is a specific uh, calculation that you're doing with respect to this but it's important to understand that the fair value of the project is contained here in these okay so now we are going to just introduce one more twist okay in this all we are going to do is in this forecasting so you've got this so this is a general so let's first see this point that in all these examples that you have done okay project if you just look at the calculation of the fair value of the project and the NPV is just uh, the difference between the cost of the project and the fair value of the project yes you can see here so you may be a little bit confused you say that when we did projects we did NPV we did not do fair value okay but actually all you're doing is 
you're just comparing the fair value of the project here with the cost of the project and coming out with a new metric called NT and PV. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that the first point we want to establish is that there is a generic formula that you're using, which you all, all of you are familiar with, that you're forecasting the returns for whether you're looking at project valuation. So you can look at the fair value of the project. NPV is just a transformation use on that using the cost of the project as an additional factor. Okay. IRR of the project also is basically involves the fair value of the project okay so we'll come to that uh, we'll come to that let's look at that as well what you're doing in IRR is okay first let's understand this so when you're doing stocks also when you're doing the Gordon growth model are you not doing the same thing you're forecasting these things become the dividends yeah these things become the dividends and actually what you remember from the Gordon growth model which is R minus G or simply by R if there is a constant dividend model okay but that actually is just a convergence of a uh, I mean that is actually just the limit that formula that you remember I hope you guys remember understand this that that formula that you remember from the Gordon growth model is just the limit of a convergent infinite series you remember infinite series yes, sir. from APGP and all that yes. yeah so there, in, there are two. Uh, they, they could be a divergent series or it could be a convergent series. Okay. In this case, this this what you do in the Gordon growth model is that's why uh, is a convergent in finite series. So the limit of that is R minus G or R. Okay. When it's a constant uh, dividend situation. Okay. So that's how you come up with the formula. Okay. So but actually, when you write out the Gordon growth model in the initial step. That final formula that you remember, okay, I'm sorry, I don't have that picture here with me. But the point is that uh, the, uh, are you guys following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You remember the Gordon growth model? Yes, sir. Where you take the dividends, okay, and you write the, the formula that you write is if it's a constant dividend, then it's D by R, right? The, so the fair value of the stock is D by R. And if it's not a formal, it's not, if it's a, uh, there is a growth rate in the dividends, then it's D by R minus G. Okay, so how did that formula come, uh, how did those formulae come to be? They came from this same kind of expression. You predicted the future dividends, okay, using the growth rate, you predicted the future, growth, so you had D0 into 1 plus G, D0 into 1 plus G square plus 1 plus G cube, etc, etc, in each of the years. Then you discounted them with these kind of discounts and that became a convergent in finite series because it's a stock valuation, there is no maturity, stocks have no maturity. So it's a convergent in finite series and the limit of that comes out to be R D by R or D by R minus G. Are you following here? Yes. Has everyone followed what I've said? Yes. So that even in the Gordon growth model, actually this same rule applies. What we have just laid out here. Is this clear? To predict the returns, discount the returns and uh, to arrive at the PV by discount, PV of each return, then sum the PVs. Is this clear? Same method is being applied in the Gordon growth model. So we have established that there is a general formula. We are applying for stocks. We are applying for projects, even for bonds. What were you doing in the case of bonds? Let me see if we have anything here. Do I have these formula are actually very difficult to write uh, because these you have to use these equations. Uh, okay, so this is not here. Uh, anyway, so you remember the formula for bonds? Okay, it's pretty much the same thing if we go back and use the same old NPV uh, project NPV again And the what are you doing in the case of bonds if you want to calculate the fair value of the bond? Okay, you are computing basically you are predicting the returns from the bond which is the coupon returns and in the last period You have the principal. Okay, and that is called a bullet repayment of principal. Okay, then the principal is repaid at maturity That's called a bullet re uh, repayment. So these terms also you should learn learn we should put them down here if we uh, since we are discussing them principal repayment can be either bullet bullet repayment means uh, the it's a one shot repayment at the end okay so these terms you should understand especially uh, chug who is going into bond analysis bullet or amortizing everybody should understand this bullet or amortizing is this clear yes Okay, so amortizing you understand when you do student loans, housing loans, those EMIs that you're paying every day, every uh, every month, okay, uh, those PM EMIs contain not just interest but also some principal pay down, right? So that kind of system is called amortizing principal. Okay, so that is called when you do swaps and things like that, these terms become important because you have, you have to understand how the principal is going to be repaid. 
okay is it a bullet repayment or is it an amortizing repayment okay all right so uh this is the uh, so this is just a side point that we are discussing since we have discussed it we have put it in here so we are talking about the general uh, general asset valuation model here all right so in the case of bonds also we do the same exact thing we predict the coupon returns from the bond and in the case of a bullet repayment last term is c plus p yeah coupon plus principal payment and then again what we are doing is we are discounting it okay adding uh, compute the pv of each return and then adding the pvs uh, coming up with the fair value of the bond is everyone clear so the first thing that we want to understand clearly here in this class the first point we have discussed is that using this general uh, general principle okay the general as asset valuation model we can value all of these things that they are all uh, they are actually all the same they are not different okay they're all the same all right now let's look at some twists here which we are going to also use to discuss the unfortunately i can't copy this and i don't have the picture here so uh, we'll have to do this now what are we going to discuss the second point i gave you a question is everyone following so far okay now let me enter before i go to the next point let me introduce a second point here which is 1.1 all right now we are going to introduce a second and we'll make it even more generic so we can apply it even to the option valuation model so we can apply it to any model we can apply it to any of these models okay all of these models are basically using the same exact principle in this periodic returns normally when we forecast how have we done it we have just picked a number out of the hat that i think when you're doing project returns okay maybe you followed some method but you just what you did was you, in your uh, spreadsheet model you just put in this return directly you thought the first year's return is going to be 150 million dollars so you put in 150 here then you put in uh, you know maybe next year's return will be 230 so you put 230 million here so on and so directly you put it in okay now i'm saying that let's introduce a little twist okay that uh, forecast returns we are going to introduce a little twist okay which will make the as the model so generic <coughs> that it can be applied even for option valuation model because even option valuation models are essentially doing the same thing by looking at the uh, along with the uh, synth uh, the uh, synthetic equivalent principle but we make the model mo model more generic now we are going to say that as expected values okay you understand the term expected value this is the same as mathematical expectation so in statistic we use in statistics we use the term mathematical expectation okay but in finance we either say expected value or we say expectation directly okay so have you come across these terms expectation of x in stats also you write it as expectation of x capital e bracket x expectation of x which is nothing but summation pi x i yes yes same as mathematical expert everybody is familiar with this concept yes. no doubts okay so now what we are saying is now because you know what you have done in the past you have directly entered the forecast like if this let, let's say these are project returns if your forecast for the first year's return was you thought that whatever you came through some process and you directly put in a number saying 230 million in the first year 500 million in the next year and so on and so that's what you've done right so in your spreadsheet you have entered let's say um where are we going to put this um we can put it here itself so in your spreadsheet you would have directly entered let's say 120 million i'm just talking in millions say 245 million in the next year okay uh 320 million in the next year and so on and so forth right can you see the numbers is it too is it too small shivam can you read the numbers yes sir yeah okay so this is what you have done in the past when you were doing your project returns okay you just directly put in some numbers okay based on whatever process you went through now i'm saying let's introduce a little tweak let's not introduce the numbers uh, let's not put in the numbers directly let's put in the numbers indirectly by writing the numbers as mathematical expectations okay so here's what i'm going to do then what i will do is now like, i don't know these numbers okay what i'm going to do let's say i don't know this 120 now it may end up being something else but we'll have to create uh, i'll just show you for the one so i had 120 here okay now it may not come out as 120 what i instead of writing 120 what i'm going to do is let me take this a little bit lower down okay so this is say year two okay and this is year three all right and here we have year one all right 
so what I'm saying is now let's not write this what you're used to which is just to write it as directly writing the numbers but I'm saying let's use it as uh, let's write them as mathematical expectations so what I'm going to say is instead of when I think about the first year's return okay I'm not going to think directly coming to 120 I will say that in the first year let's say uh, I'll just write let's say there's a 30 percent chance that we will make uh, say 95 million okay then there is a 40 percent chance that we'll make uh, 200 million and then there is a uh, let's just make it simple and let's uh, no let's let's make split it further let's, let's say the 15 percent chance then we have to move this a little bit Okay, and then we have, uh, no, let's make it 10% and let's make it 20%. Okay, so we check that our probabilities add up to 100. Okay, they add up to 100. We make this probabilities. All right, and then we say there's a 10% chance, chance of earning, let's say, uh, 400 million. I'm just putting arbitrary numbers. Okay, and then there's a 20% chance of earning 150 million. Okay. Are you following what I'm doing? So when I'm thinking about the first year's return, instead of directly coming up with a number, I'm splitting up my decision making process further by saying that the first year's return, I don't, I'm not going to forecast it directly, but I am going to think probabilistically about the first year's return distribution, the distribution of the first year's return. Is this clear? That we are saying that according to me, there's a 30% chance that the first year's return will be 95. Uh, there's a 40% chance that it will be 200. There's a 10% chance that it will be 400. And then there's a 20% chance that is 180 is this clear so now then my first year's forecast of return has to be uh, well let's just say we'll make it uh, okay let's just compute this all right and so basically this uh, becomes some of this are you has everyone followed what I've done okay so my first year's cash flow forecast is now 178 and a half first year's return forecast is 178 and a half I did not directly come up with this number as you can see I had no clue what it was going to be but I was quite sure that there was a 30 percent chance it'd be 95 and so on and so forth this is clear so now I'm introducing another tweak into your uh, gen generic asset valuation model the earlier steps you were all familiar with anyway and you are also familiar with the concept of mathematical expectation so that we are not introducing any new concept as such okay all we are doing is we are combining two concepts and we are saying now don't forecast the periodic returns directly but forecast them as expected values okay this is also called expected value so this thing that we did okay this thing that we did here is or it can be called the mathematical expectation of the first year's return it can be called the expectation of the first year's return or it can also be called the expected value of the first year's return all these three so you should also be familiar with the language what kind of expressions are used to describe the same thing okay all of these mean the same thing so here obviously expected is does not mean that I expect that it will rain tomorrow it's not being used the word expected is not being used in that sense okay it's being used in the sense of statistical uh, ex uh, you know mathematical expectation is this clear okay so now have you understood what tweak we have introduced okay so if you remember this and if you do anytime you do a project valuation or anytime you're forecasting returns from some distress credits like with, where you may be working on distress credits okay where you're trying to figure out the cash flows of a slightly uh, you know company in financial difficulties okay so even there I think this process is much better to forecast the returns when you're talking the five fair value of the bond okay don't forecast it directly but think probabilistically that makes your thinking much more granular and later on when there's some change in the circumstances what you do is you adjust the probability uh, distribution here you adjust you never tweak this directly if you think there's some changes here something things have become the environment will become much more rosy there's a massive tax cut from the government okay so then what you do is this probability of a low return 30 percent this you can reduce to maybe make it 10 uh, let's say um, 15 percent okay and then you can make this as 55 percent yes are you following what I did because there was a massive tax cut from the government so you have updated your returns expectations because the economy is going to boom 
all right so now you see that number has gone from 170 to 194 but this is a much more rigorous process okay because it forces you to think probabilis uh, in these probabilities okay so it makes your thinking more granular so this is a much better discipline to follow all right so you have followed this now now if you can remember this gen generic asset valuation model as we have modified it here to forecast the returns as expected values that's it basically it covers all and when you, once you come it covers all of this stream okay it covers all of this uh, side of the uh, the uh, framework and it also covers all of this with the additional concept of the synthetic equivalent which you have also understood okay so they're basically going to pred uh, predict where you have certain because sometimes you may have forward rates you may be selling uh, when you're computing the synthetic equivalent okay you may be selling something at a forward rate okay so then you will have especially in the case of option valuation valuation this becomes more important okay so this really is more important for forecast based valuation and option valuation models what will happen in the case of uh, if, if you have this kind of a where everything is locked in okay where everything is locked in let me go back here okay here we were practicing uh, please pay attention these are all important concepts you better make sure that you understand everything that is being discussed okay here we are predicting the returns from a project yes okay so therefore now you understand how this generic formula can be applied in all situations okay once we have modified it to do uh, expected returns okay it will apply in all situations it will apply here it will apply here okay and it will also it will apply especially in options and even here it will apply how we'll show you because we said on this branch what do we have we have pure classical riskless arbitrage pure arbitrage free valuation there is no forecast okay so then you might ask this question so if there is no question forecast involved everything is seen everything is clear to me 100 percent in front i can lock in all the prices then what will i do with the probabilities okay so then comes the question you see how probability is a, a flexible concept okay right now why do i have all these probabilities because these are project returns i don't know what's going to happen right I'm thinking of it uh, you know I don't know what's going to happen because so that's why I have to think in terms of probabilities right because it's uncertain right but if I have let's say that if I know for sure that I will get uh, a, a 200 return but I will get it after five years the forward price is available to me I've locked in the return I'll get it after five years okay so in this case if I'm sure about the 200 then what happens to this distribution what is the probability of a sure certain event one yeah so here then what will happen is i'll just write all of these will become zero this will become zero this will become zero and this will become hundred how will that also become zero <laughs> this will become now i've got 200 can you see what is happening so therefore this general model this general principle this general asset valuation model can be applied for all valuation situations whether you have pure classical riskless arbitrage where everything is locked in you may have locked in a forward price where the settlement of the deal will happen after five years okay but the thing is that you can discount that return only thing you'll do is you're still applying so what you have to understand is you're not even in this situation even in a situation where your return of 200 is guaranteed okay you are actually not writing to 200 directly because you are always following the general principle the general formula so you're not writing 200 directly what you're writing is 200 into one <coughs> are you following right so that discipline should be maintained so your thinking will remain clear that you're uh, you're applying because if you just write 200 directly it may seem to you that uh, if you just like uh, 200 directly then it may seem to you that uh, well this general formula with expected returns is being applied only here and only here but is not being applied here are you following what i'm saying right but actually that's not true even in the situation where everything is guaranteed all prices are locked in okay even there the uh, formula the same same framework is being applied but only that you're writing it as uh, 200 into 1 so you're still using expected value are you following right even when the return is guaranteed so when you're ret forecasting returns like in bonds when you're forecasting returns from gov local currency government bonds okay so local currency government bonds are virtually guaranteed to pay out there's no risk okay the one exception to that is the russian default of 1997 okay i don't know if it's 97 or 98 but the, the one which came with this i think it was 97 so the russian government defa defaulted on ruble bonds 
which they need not have done because the Russian central bank would have just printed rubles and paid off the money. But the Russian government defaulted on ruble denominated bonds, which was a very unusual event and caused a lot of disruption in the global financial markets. It led to the collapse of a major fund called long term capital management. You can read it up LTCM and the Russian crisis. Okay, so that's the one example that I know. There may be some other examples in history, but in general, local currency government bonds in a fiat currency regime are risk free. Okay, let's write this principle also. Let's write this concept. You understand what a fiat currency? So this is another concept that we are discussing. Okay, uh, this is our third concept that we are discussing. Uh, generic asset valuation models. This is our third concept. Uh, this is actually the first, but we have introduced. So this is a different hot topic. So it's got a different star on it. Now we are discussing the concept of credit risk. Okay, credit risk in um, credit risk in government bonds okay this is a second topic that we are a second side topic that we are discussing is everyone following the discussion here right so credit risk in government bonds so the general expression that we may uh, write the general thing is you understand what is a fiat currency regime so in india we have a fiat you understand what a fiat is not a car <laughs> huh? fiat no no <coughs> fade fake no 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 fiat fiat means fiat means order of a so it's like order of a so sovereign okay this is the this is say uh, chandragupta's fiat so that means he has given this order okay so fiat means it's an order of a sovereign okay so it's of somebody with a lot of power okay so when you can say these uh, mullahs issued a fatwa against salman rushdi that is also a fatwa can also be seen as a fiat okay if it's coming from a sufficiently powerful person so fiat as in spelt in fiat f-i-a-t f-i-a-t fiat like the car okay but fiat means the order of a sovereign okay so basically in india also we have a fiat currency why do we accept these 10 rupee 20 rupee notes because the reserve bank says that this is legal tender okay the reserve bank is representing the government so india also has most of the modern countries have fiat currency regimes okay basically the money is there is paper money and why is it why do people even give it any value because the government says that this money is legal tender this is clear okay so that is what is meant by a fiat currency regime i'm not writing this ex long explanation but you can remember this okay so fiat currency regime so what we say is that uh, so generally okay so you can understand all this generally so we are talking about credit risk in government bonds why is this topic important because we are talking about applying the generic asset valuation formula even to bonds okay so while having that discussion i think it's useful to discuss this point okay so generally uh, is everyone following some of the faces are looking little doped out are you okay are you following yes, yes okay if you don't follow it's your job to ask okay sometimes i see people then i ask them looking, looking at their face and then it emerges that they have not followed okay but i can't keep doing that uh, all the time for example yes for example yes yes no no but yash is asking questions the for example would be gulati yes sir. for example is gulati who is not following and not that day we caught you you were not following and you were not asking so yash is normally he asks questions sg1 is mr bindas so we have no we have no uh, uh, we expect him to be relaxed okay so generally the principle that we are talking about is generally um local currency i'm writing ccy for currency okay local currency government bonds please pay attention i'm hearing noises people talking local currency government bonds in a fiat currency uh, regime so india we say india australia uk canada they all have fiat currency regimes us any country because the money is paper money the only reason it has value is because the central bank on behalf of the government says this is legal tender worth so many rupees okay so that's a fiat currency regime local currency government bonds in a fiat currency regime are um, risk free i mean as basically free of credit risk not risk no, not free of market risk free of credit risk you understand the difference yes sir okay free of credit risk means there's no no chance that the government will not pay the coupon or the principal okay no chance of default okay are free of credit risk okay generally why did i say generally <laughs> because there is an exception very important exception uh, which is the russian default of you can 
check it up if you look at it in connection with LTCM you'll get the exact year whether it happened in 97 or 98 exception is the Russian um, sovereign default you understand what is a sovereign default sovereign default means the government defaults on its own bonds okay so Russian sovereign I'm not spelling it correctly uh, Russian sovereign default of 1997 okay why is this an exception because obviously you know that the russian government defaulted on global bonds okay so i'm not going to write that here this is clear because i'm talking about this as an exception to the general principle of local currency debt being free of uh, thing but go and capture garvit also and bring him back. go with a net or something you know like capture him and bring him back no no here one person has already gone okay the Russian sovereign default of 1997 uh, okay LTCM collapse LTCM is long-term capital management so that also I'm not writing you should remember that it's a famous fund you can read up on it okay you can search YouTube as well you'll get some information you'll learn about certain things okay what happens to highly leveraged uh, uh, entities okay this is a quantitative fund that collapsed so long term LTCM stands for long-term capital manager I'm not writing all that you can google this stuff okay uh, and the related LTCM collapse the Russian default led to a global market disruption and eventually the collapse of LTCM okay so this is a general principle that we have learned now you understood this principle local currency government bonds are generally risk-free so why did I come to the concept of risk-free free of credit risk because we were talking about applying this generic formula okay where we have expected returns okay we have applying it so when you are applying it even in the case of uh, government bonds okay there's no risk in the case of local currency government bonds there's no risk of default so the $200 that is going to be paid after one year has no there's no need to write it with some the probability but you still use the same expression so you write 200 with a hundred percent probability this is clear is everyone following yeah yeah as a general principle local currency because why why do you understand why did you understand why because it, it basically it is much easier politically from the government and I'm right not writing the democracy part say most of the countries are democracies okay uh, because think about it if the government of India defaults on bonds okay if the government of India defaults on its bonds okay it's it's quite a PR pro it's a major PR PR disaster okay then maybe some government a lot of some uh, pension funds are invested in government bonds okay maybe some uh, retail investors have invested in their debt funds which invest in government bonds so all those funds will go bankrupt if the government of India defaults so which government is going to take all this PR heat in a democracy because next time they lose the election okay what is much easier for the government to do the RBI can print money at the government's direction so if some amount of money has to be paid say hundred million dollars has to be paid why are you going out now he has already gone yeah. no you wait for him to come back no, wait for Yash to come back we have a rule now Garvit has already violated that rule so I have to penalize him actually on I have to go I'm going to penalize him today on marks because he's not following the instructions okay uh, now I don't have time I do do all this policing I'm gonna police or am I gonna teach okay now are you guys following what is being discussed here we are discussing the principle of why local currency sovereign debt is generally considered to be free of credit risk because in most countries which are democracies if the government defaults on its bonds it's a major of course they, they could do it in Russia because at the time it was not a democracy even now there are some question marks about democracy so the the government held a lot of power so they didn't really care about what the people thought right but in most countries can you imagine an India government defaulting on its bonds it's not going to do that because the political cost is too high much easier for the government to tell RBI go print some money and pay these bonds are you following if there's not enough when do you default when there's not enough money to pay the bonds right so instead of doing that you just tell the reserve bank go and print some money and pay these bonds are you following what I'm saying no reserve bank can actually the reserve bank I think required under law to buy any excess when it will not happen exactly like that it will happen the government will issue bonds and the reserve bank will be forced to buy them but how will it's going to buy them where is it going to get the money from it will print more money the reserve bank can print unlimited amounts of money 
that it will actually the process by which will happen is the government will issue bonds and the reserve bank will buy them okay and where will they buy how will they buy it? where's the money coming from they are printing money okay because money is what the reserve bank says it is right so they can that's called expanding the money supply the reserve bank has the power to expand you've run your macroeconomics yes, m1 m2 and all that stuff okay broad money and all these concepts okay so you can expand the monetary base the reserve bank can expand the monetary base right they can pump money into the system right so therefore uh, the point that's why we say this we have spent a lot of time on this principle but it's still important to understand why this is true that in most countries the government would rather because it's a fiat. that's why this word fiat currency regime has been put in why did i say fiat currency regime to accompany this principle that local currency government bonds are generally free of credit risk why did i add this qualifier a fiat currency regime because in a fiat currency regime the central bank can expand the money supply because the money is what it says it is if you have a gold standard you understand gold standard gold standard where you have to your amount of money in the economy is backed by gold there needs to be a ratio to maintain if you want to increase the money supply you need more gold okay so there the, that's why i didn't say gold standard i said fiat currency regime fiat currency regime is different from a gold standard in a gold standard there is a central bank does not have the control over the money supply because if you want to increase you need to increase the gold supply are you still, are you clear is everyone following okay we are just following a general uh, uh, we are just expanding on a uh, a general term yes garvit we are going to penalize you today because you have taken a long time every day you are going out sir i have lost my car key sir i was searching for that sir no that you search after class you search after class why are you searching during the class sir, can i move yeah, no, but Yash has not now. Somebody else went out. Who went out? Yash has gone. Yes. Kanika has also gone out. Everybody has gone out. One minute. Let Yash come back. Yash has not come back. So I don't know why Yash also went out. Somebody has to monitor this. Gulati, can you monitor this? Make sure that not more than one person goes out at a time. Okay. So we are just discussing that we have spent a lot of time in on this topic, but these are all important concepts which you need to understand okay fiat currency regime are you on, are you able to follow why i'm saying this that in most countries the government where is she going now <laughs> so my number the phone no you keep your phone now your phone is supposed to be switched off it's my turn will you sit here and uh, okay you go out come back quickly this phone business is all the every call, call is urgent then every call that is coming is urgent you have to keep your phone on, you have to switch on the phone only within, uh, I mean, there, there have to be some other people at home who can take care of a problem, no? Then, uh, okay. So, uh, so the point I'm trying to emphasize, has everyone understood? I'm just giving you a detailed discussion of this problem, but it's still an important point that you should understand. That the it's much easier for the government to just print money and take care of the bond payment, okay? And the way the printing money happens is the central bank prints the money and buys the government bonds. The government will issue more bonds to pay the maturing bonds. That's what will happen. The government will issue more bonds to pay the maturing bonds and the RBI is actually required to buy any residual government bonds which are not sold in the market. The Reserve Bank has to buy them. Okay, and they will buy it by effectively when they buy the money, they will uh, when they buy the bonds, they'll have to sell money and they will produce the money and sell it to the government. <coughs> is this clear? Yes, Pulkit. Sir, I was asking where are the government, then the reserve bank lost its value. So what do you think is happening in Indian rupees? <laughs> when when we started out, the Indian rupee was I think what? I think 10, 40, I don't know what it was, maybe some it was much lower, it was maybe 35, 40 or something. And why do you think this has been happening? Why do you think the rupee is now at 70? When you look at the Singapore dollar, when you look at the Japanese yen from the 1970s onwards, they have appreciated against the US dollar. The Singapore dollar is appreciated against the US dollar. Okay. If you look at a chart, like if you look at any chart, we're not going to go into that right now, but you have those links. I've given you that uh, FX stock. If you look at this, okay. I don't know if this, this may also be blocked. No, it's working. Okay. So just to come to question, Pulkit's question, Pulkit's question is correct. We are going to change this to US dollar and we are going to make this. This is a very useful site for, um, where is India? <coughs> now you see, I can't see the, I can't see the scale. All right, but let's go down and see the sale. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Where is it now? 
Um, so it was 10. So it, it is actually 4.76 is the low in 1965. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you guys see that? 1965 approximately 4.76 is the low. You can't see the 4.76. But here now you can see 4.76. Yes. Right. So Pulkit's question. Yeah, it's a very good question. That is what is happening. What is happening here? Law of supply and demand. Excess supply. What happens to the price? When you have excess supply, price will fall. So what is happening here is basically the price of Indian rupee is falling. So this chart is dollars. So the dollar value is rising. That's what you're seeing. So what you're seeing here, why this rupee is like this? Because of mismanagement, fiscal mismanagement, nothing but nothing other than fiscal mismanagement. Sheer bad policies. There's nothing that we were not fated to become like this. We were not fated, just pure bad policy management. You want to see something else? You want to see, let's say, what happens with good policy management in a country which has no um, no resources. Okay. Singapore, where is Singapore? No resources, country with no resources. Okay, no resources, pretty much an uneducated population from 1963 to 2015. Can you see the difference? This is dollar as base asset. In the one case, the dollar is appreciated so much, gone from 4 to 75, 70, 72. Okay, and in the one case, the dollar has fallen. Singapore became independent in 1965. So, uh, 1965 here. So, you can see it was around 3.06. When Singapore became independent in 1965, it was around 3.06, and now you see where the dollar is. Okay, it's around 1. 1.35 or something like that. Okay, so it is more than halved. The dollar is more than halved in value. Okay, what is this? This is a country with a tiny country with no resources, no oil, nothing, no gas, no no coal, nothing. Just good management. All that financial stuff has come from good management, open markets. Singapore is the most open economy in the world. Okay, you understand how you you know how you measure? Have you heard this term, open economy, yes, sir. which is the most open economy in the world? Yeah. How do they come? Very good. So how do they come up with this answer? How do we come up with this answer? Okay, we say that Gulati is the tallest. How? Because we have the height. We use the. Uh, we are measuring the height. Okay. So how do we come? How do we measure openness of an economy? One minute. Another another side point that we have to learn. Another side point. One minute. Let me make sure that we have the side points document. Are you following what is being done here? All side points are being documented separately so that you understand. These are all important points. Okay. Since we are discussing this, as a, we have deviated a little bit. Okay. Uh, are you guys disturbed by the way that sometimes we drift across to other things? Does that disturb you? Okay. Because these are not planned. These are not planned. I didn't like have a plan. I had a separate plan, but now we are just diverging because based on the questions. Okay, so we are responding to the questions and and expanding the scope of the discussion, which is what I believe should be done because the whole point of coming to class is to ask questions. So the focus of the class has to be to answer the questions in a proper way. Okay, what are we discussing? Open economy. Okay, how do we discuss open economy? Okay, how do you discuss the openness of an economy? Okay, openness of an economy equals okay you didn't know this measure I guess exports plus imports divided by what use your common sense okay <laughs> Now understand this. This is the way you measure. This is the way you measure the openness of an economy. So for every country, you can because obviously, if you want to uh, measure, so if you want to say which is the most open economy, you have to weigh. Up, you have to have a measure of openness of an economy. Okay, it could be openness or closeness, whatever you want to see, half full or half empty. So the measure that you use is this. Okay, open uh, export plus imports by GDP. If you use this, you will see that Singapore has the and the higher this is, the the more open the economy is. So Singapore has a very very open economy. Okay, very low tariffs. Okay, so that's how they become prosper prosperous and they had by, by and large no capital controls from the very beginning if I like and remember no capital controls so a Singaporean person see in India as I told you 
Okay, if Roger Federer were an Indian and he had a billion dollars worth of wealth and he suddenly decided one fine day, no, I don't like the rupee, I want to move, move everything into Canadian dollars, he can't do that. There are certain limits the RBI places on how much money you can take out of the country in a given year. Okay, right now it's around 750 to 1 million legally. Okay, but in Singapore, there are no controls. Okay, so if a Singaporean billionaire wants to move all his money, sell Singapore dollars and buy Australian dollars, there's no restriction. Okay, so you can see all the prosperous countries. You can see what it does to the currency how strong cur the currency is and inflation in singapore is very low in india we have very big a very big problem with inflation until recently now with the new framework we are able to uh, control it a little bit okay but we've had a big problem with inflation part of the reason for the currency depreciation is also the inflation okay and the inflation is also connected to the point that pulkit raised expansion of money supply you heard the expression called in uh, too much money chasing too few goods Inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods. Okay, so that's the monetarist view of inflation. So this is actually true to a great extent that if you have a fixed amount of goods and you print too much money, the price of each unit of the good will go up because everybody now has more money in their hands. Yeah. Okay. So so this is a long discussion, long answer to Pulkit's question. But are you uh, are you okay with the answer? You understood. So what has happened? What you predicted has actually happened. You saw that in the case of the Indian rupee, and you can also see what happens when you have, um, you know, uh, when you have uh, good economic management. Okay, openness of an economy. I'll just put the link over here. So put SG. We discuss Singapore as, a, as the most open economy in the world, and I'm so I'm putting the link here for the Singapore dollar. You can experiment with the rupee as well on that chart. Okay. All right, guys. So let's um, go back to our point. So we have diverted a little bit, but these are all relevant discussions emanating from the questions. Okay. So. Um, a contrast to the so we go back to our asset valuation discussion what is the point that we were trying to establish that you can use this general framework with expected returns to value any any asset so when you're valuing government bonds you would simply say that the returns in each year are basically instead of writing 200 directly you're going to write it as 1 into 200 this is clear because you're using the same framework okay and if you look at all option valuation models we will not be discussing them in detail but essentially what all option valuation models do is essentially the same thing okay they are looking at the expectation of the return they are forecasting the returns okay if it becomes very clear when you see the binomial model visually becomes very clear okay but they are following the same general principle okay and they are looking at the uh, the present value of the uh, of the returns and compare using the synthetic evaluation uh, synthetic equivalent bus concept also and you so if you use this general principle so the point to what we are trying to make here is perhaps we took a long time making the point that all these asset valuation models have a commonality okay basically that is involved uh, that is that involves the forecast of the expected returns now we are no longer saying forecast of returns we are saying forecast of expected returns because we have expanded the framework yeah so forecast of expected returns discounted and just add the pvs of all the individual returns this is clear okay so we spent a lot of time but are you did you get some extra clarity yes. hopefully because we have actually discussed all the stuff that you got all you guys have already done but we have tried to show that the uh, there all the methods are actually the same so you should think of it as uh, application of a general principle across uh, all these cases okay that helps you to remember it better okay so we have covered this now we have one more point left to cover okay within the concept of valuation i think one we have one important point left to cover and that is uh, we have two more important points to cover okay which is this okay now remember that i also said that uh, this is falling under the price versus fair value comparison method all these things are falling under this umbrella okay so in this umbrella what do you do you compute the fair value which we have uh, here we have something here no I think this is in your uh, okay we have this yeah um, so in all these uh, in these models in in, in these in this uh, set of frameworks okay when we go back to this 
uh, all these were since this is falling under this and everything that falls under this what is the general framework that we are using we are using this general framework of uh, this that we calculate the fair value we calculate the fair value I'm just going to uh, copy this once again okay and put it into your notes at this point okay okay that here we are using this uh, these steps okay right these are the steps we are following now I'm trying to show you why this this uh, framework is correct okay now you might question this where in the project and PV system where do we do this right are you following what question I'm asking because I have put this under this umbrella right and I have said that everything under this umbrella basically involves this kind of thinking which is calculate the fair value these are the steps calculate the fair value observe the market price compare the market price to the fair value if the market price is below the fair value then buy if the market price above the fair value then sell this framework also has to be clearly understood although it may be very obvious to you but always think like you're talking to a computer okay so now you may ask this question now where in this project valuation scheme where is this applied how is this applicable in the, because I put the projects also under this umbrella <coughs> that means in project valuation also we are doing the same thing okay so the question you might ask is where is this happening in the case of the project please explain okay so let's go back to the project where we can see this uh, all right let's look at this now see we already understood that in the case of the project this is the fair value of the project this component yes are you, are you guys following this was the fair value of the project now what is this c0 that we are adding here <laughs> initial investment so can we call it the market price of the project Yes. everyone be convinced that can we call it the market price of the project yes Tarun is it okay to call it the market price of the project because this cost is we normally call it the cost of the project okay you might say that cost is not the same as market price but this understand cost for whom let's say the Delhi Metro wants to expand the network to Karnal okay and LNT construction gives a bid of say 100 million dollars okay so 100 million they will execute the project and extend the metro to canal okay now this 100 when lnt construction is bidding 100 million do you think the cost of it for lnt construction to make the project is 100 million it's got to be something less they have built in a profit margin okay so lnt constructions for cost from the vendor's point of view is not this okay this is not the cost from the vendor's point of view but the price that what will the delhi metro put into their npv calculations they will in this c0 they will put in 100 million yes yes so it is not the cost for the vendor but it is certainly the cost for the uh, person who is evaluating the project because for delhi metro it's like a market so when i when i say if i buy a pizza for 200 rupees that's not the cost for the pizza maker right but it is i can say that the cost of my pizza was 200 rupees and it's also fair to say that the market price of the pizza for me was 200 rupees that's the cost i had to shell out to basically uh, you know to buy the pizza are you following okay so there's a little bit of words words are changing and all that but make sure that you understand everyone is clear that this is the market price the c0 that you put into the npv formula is actually the market price of the project everyone is convinced Gulati are you convinced so which part do you don't understand no but this part you have understood that if we say that we are evaluating the cost of building extending the metro line to Karnal let's say hundred million dollars okay and these will be the fair value of the project the returns what is coming here all the revenue that the Delhi Metro will get all these are all the revenues from ticket sales from advertising sales on the platforms and everywhere else okay all the other franchise whatever is the source of revenue for Delhi Metro is okay so uh, everything is going to be here okay so these are this is the fair value component and the c0 your everyone is familiar with this npv formula right yes. so the c0 now i'm just change i'm forcing you to change the language usually we consider this the cost of the project okay i'm saying that the cost of the project for the person who's evaluating the project is the same as the market price of the project because they're essentially buying the project for this 
what are they getting once the line is completed the project is finished so assuming that assume that the line was uh, already completed and it's a question it was owned by reliance uh, maybe it was owned by like the airport express okay maybe it was owned by reliance the line was already existing it's the same thing as instead of getting it constructed for c0 now you're buying it from reliance at c0 it's the same thing you're getting hold of the thing for this amount of money yeah नेटवर्क <laughs> and it's owned by somebody else and you buy it from them or you pay a contractor to construct the uh, extension of the line yes. right both ways what is happening this is the amount of money uh, i should actually be indifferent because either way i'm getting what i want i want the line to be extended i am getting that and in both cases i am having to pay out some money so whether i get the extended line by buying an existing line or i get a line constructed it comes to the same thing does it not come to the same thing question yeah what is the question i didn't I'll ask after the class please yeah no no maybe maybe if i explain a little bit more uh, you'll understand what we are trying to show is here what happens now i'll have to cut marks for pulkit and puneet there is too much talking going on now you have, normally you were not considered a problem group but now you have become a problem group okay any questions or anything any discussion should be with me not with uh, between yourselves okay so uh, because we are trying to discuss concepts here trying to understand how it all fits into the same so what we are trying to do here is basically clear uh, clarify some of your uh, conceptual understanding so if you understand everything as part of a general framework okay and a general formula then it will be much easier for you to remember everything because you know that is only one general principle that is being applied so we are now trying to show that this is basically the same as the market price because what did we say npv is also covered under this umbrella so that means under npv also the same thing should be working that if the fair value is more than the market price then i'll buy the project and if the fair value is more than the market price i'll sell the project okay so that kind of similar kind of thinking should come through okay so now we already saw that show, uh, we already saw that this is the fair value yes you agree that this is the fair value and we are only that only argument that is happening is that we are familiar with this being the cost of the project i am saying that the cost of the project there are two perspectives on cost one is the vendor's cost and one is the person who is evaluating the project okay so there is let's take delhi lnt and delhi in delhi metro okay so lnt and dmrc in this example okay dmrc wants to extend the line to karnal lnt puts in a bid of 100 million dollars so what they're saying is for 100 million dollars we will get this job done okay so if they don't see the construction for them it's basically like let's say the construction can be done very quickly okay so for the sake of simplicity we assume that it can be instantly constructed they have a prefab line they just erected okay so that means what's happening for delhi metro's point of view they are paying 100 million dollars and they're getting the line the same i am paying 200 rupees and getting the pizza so for me it's the market price of the pizza is 200 rupees because what i have to pay to buy anything is the market price right yes okay so what we are saying is the cost has two perspectives one is the vendor's cost so 100 million is certainly not the vendor's cost most likely not of the vendor's cost is slightly lower than that they are building in some profit margin in extremely competitive bidding situations you may not build in anything you may want to get the deal okay but in general we would expect there's a profit margin built in so that lnt has some uh, cost of construction is lower than 100 million okay but the 100 million is the cost for the uh, delhi metro to get this thing done for dmrc 
right yes everyone is convinced don't have to be convinced because i'm saying it with a loud voice okay you have to be convinced conceptually you have to be clear in your mind that this is the market price because this is what you have to pay to get the thing done so imagine that the line was already existing you would pay 100 million to get the line get the ownership transferred in your name instead of being owned by reliance that line is now owned by dmrc so they are doing the same thing right so that is the market price is what you pay to buy something yes people don't seem very convinced so i don't want to shove this framework down your uh, are you convinced are you following not very convincing expression is not convincing okay maybe if you can think about it a little bit later but ha uh, list uh, think about it but essentially this is the market price because this is what you have to pay to get the job done to or to, to buy an existing line if you think of this as some existing project where you're just buying you're buying something when you typically have heard this expression called asset sales when you have an asset sale right let's go back to the example of hcl tech and the uh, buying of the ibm licenses okay we are going to use the same thing let's assume that that buying of the licenses is like a project okay so here hcl would compute the returns from the licenses it will basically license out those uh, basically software okay they'll be like licensing out all the software and every year they'll be earning some revenue from the licenses right okay and they would discount those revenues and compute the pv of all those revenues so here except for this term the rest of the terms together is the fair value of the licenses right and what does h uh, what does hcl have to do to uh, and what is how much they have to pay let's say they have to pay say 200 million to buy those licenses okay so this c0 will be written as 200 million right so they will see whether this investment it's like an investment for them okay whether this investment should be made or not okay they will apply the same kind of framework okay they can apply the same kind of framework essentially uh, okay it is quite uh, logical to apply the same framework they will see whether this investment has a uh, how big is the npv whether it's positive positive in the first place right so they are paying 200 million that's the market price of the licenses <coughs> yes is it a little clear sakshi now you are buying it from so it may not be a market price in the sense that this is a market price now we have lost our uh, there's some problem of um, there's a display problem here i think somewhere there's a problem anyway we'll just try to manage for the rest of the class we have lost the connection as well okay guys please pay attention the last bench people are dozing off yes early morning first period okay so i want to see everybody focused on whatever i'm saying okay if you don't understand it uh, uh, you have to ask a question but you should be focused here on what is being taught okay so it's not market price in the sense that the market price of uh, december uh, gold is uh, you know one for offer price is 1459.50 not like this because december comex gold is actively traded on a platform everybody in the world can buy sell it's not that sense of market price but it's a market price it's still correct to call it a market price because that's what you have to pay to get hold of it right just like the pizza i'm buying is not something okay so available on the platform many people can buy it for the same price so it's not a very good example but uh, the point is again that it's it's not like something which is actively traded okay it's still the market price is anything that you have to pay to get to get hold of the asset right in that sense okay everyone follows it's not that this sense of the market price so what are we saying here so one minute so understand the rule why does the same principle always uh, why does the same principle still apply what is the principle that if market price this is the principle right why do these rules still uh, still apply what are you doing you do you accept a project with a negative npv if it's a negative npv what does it mean fair value is less than price so now that we have uh, anybody has any doubt please ask just like sakshi asked the question so good so whenever you have any doubt you should ask a question okay you should not accept something just because i'm saying with a loud voice i'm screaming you know like sometimes you have teachers who the, i mean we had some teachers who, who didn't really understand the the case but uh, he used to come to class and read the case uh, in a very loud voice so it would seem like it would be kind of authoritative and just students would not ask questions because uh, he didn't like questions being asked so i don't want to do it like that that if you have any question you have to ask okay 
so uh, so we, once we have established that this is like the market price because the person who is evaluating the project for him the cost of the project is the same as the market is the same as the market price because it what he has to pay to get hold of the project okay yes so when you negative npv project is rejected what does that mean when that means the market price is higher than fair value yes gulati are you following this negative npv project means this is this is more absolute value of this is more than the sum of all these yes sir yes okay so negative npv that means that the sum of all this is the fair value that means market price is higher than fair value and you are rejecting it which means you are following this framework yes sir rejecting the project is like selling the project yes sir imagine if the project were actually now imagine that the project why is it conceptually like selling the project imagine that the project was actually being actively traded like on a platform like this if the project was actually being traded and it had a market price of something which is you felt was too high compared to the fair value okay then you would sell it because what do you believe if you are in this box if you are in this box what do you believe that the market price must eventually come to fair value so that's why when you see anything above the fair value you sell it sometimes it may not be possible to sell it but conceptually the idea is the same like in indian equities you have seen it difficult to do short selling because the system is not well developed okay but conceptually you know what short sell what in what situation you would want to short sell is this clear are you following what i'm saying okay now we have to cut for bharat and ganotra also there's a lot of talking yes, class is over when i say it's over you don't decide when the class is over yes sir one minute so i didn't know that the class was over but anyway sir. that's a different thing so our class monitor the class termination monitor is over there no when he starts getting restless then we know the class is over yes. okay one minute okay so we have had a long discussion we didn't really manage to cover much ground but i i hope you guys understood what was being discussed okay so try to go and fit the npv will continue with it. we are losing a lot of time but these are important concepts okay guys you can go now but you guys will lose your points we need to crack down on this too much talking going on actually and she one is very happy <laughs>